I thus address the world through the medium of the latest wonderful invention, so that my voice, like my great show, will reach future generations and be heard centuries after I have joined the great, and as I believe, happy majority. Welcome to Becoming Barnum, the journey to fame and fortune, a podcast presented by the Barnum Museum in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and based on their award-winning blog series. Support for this project is presented to the Barnum Museum from the City of Bridgeport American Rescue Plan Act Funds, Peoples United, a division of M&T Bank, and the Connecticut Humanities and National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the Federal American Rescue Plan Act. The Barnum Museum has a special treasure in its collection, a 750-page copybook of letters written by Phineas Taylor Barnum when he was traveling in Europe in the 1840s, introducing his young protege, General Tom Thumb, to high society and royalty, as well as millions of ordinary people. Barnum's lively letters to friends, family members, and business associates reveal him more completely as a person at times struggling mightily to make the three-year tour a success, all the while directing the management of his American museum from afar. They also offer insights into Barnum as a husband, father, and nephew, and as a mentor to the child actor-entertainer whose popularity resulted in their meteoric rise to fame and fortune. In his mid-30s at the time, Barnum proved himself a tireless go-getter calculating risk-taker, and astute entrepreneur decades before his name was attracting crowds to the greatest show on earth. These letters offer a window into the hard scrabble era of show business, revealing how Barnum went about acquiring, hiring, and commissioning attractions, and promoting his museum and the general Tom Thumb tour in Europe. Join us as we travel back in time to learn through Barnum's own words about the real person behind the legendary P.T. Barnum. We have got quite territory enough. We recently received an inquiry asking if Barnum's letter contained any comments about the Mexican-American War. At that point, Adrian was still going through letters from November of 1845 and thought that she would more likely find something on the topic in his 1846 letters. Then, wouldn't you know, she came across letters that contain political remarks and comments about war, content that is rather different from what we've seen up to this point. Though Barnum was not referring to the Mexican-American War in his letters of November 12th and 15th, there is a connection between the Mexican-American War and the potential war with England that he was writing about, a war that didn't happen, thankfully. Dual escalating disputes over territories, one with Great Britain and one with Mexico, were occurring simultaneously in 1845 and 1846, and eventually led to President James K. Polk's decision to back down on one in order to avert another war. The dispute with Great Britain concerned the Oregon Country, or what the British referred to as the Columbia District, an area of land they claimed in the Pacific Northwest from the 42nd parallel northward. Since 1818, both the British and Americans had occupied and jointly controlled the area, but as more settlers arrived in the West, conflicts arose. American expansionists, who had supported the Democratic ticket with candidate Polk, wanted to push the British claim from the 42nd parallel, now the border between California and Oregon, all the way up to the 59-degree, 40-minutes north line, which is more than 400 miles, as the crow flies, northwest of Vancouver, British Columbia. The Brits weren't about to agree to that, and the possibility of war loomed. Meanwhile, long-simmering territorial disputes in the southwest heated up with the annexation of Texas, The prospect of fighting two wars at once was formidable. Thus, after the U.S. declared war on Mexico on May 13, 1846, the need for a resolution to the Oregon question became a priority. The Oregon Treaty was signed a month later, on June 15, 1846. 
It established the 49th parallel as British North America's southern border. Ironically, that had been Polk's original proposal, rejected by the British, before the more extreme 5440 or fight rallying of unyielding expansionists provoked even greater tension between the two countries. So that is a bit of historical context for understanding Barnum's political comments in these next letters. On November 12th, Barnum wrote to his older half-brother Philo F. Barnum in Bridgeport, essentially to call in a favor for a friend, and in that letter he shared his views about a war with England. Though writing from Paris, Barnum had just taken a brief trip to England at the end of October, and thus heard the opinions of his English acquaintances and read editorials in the London newspapers. To Philo, he remarked, The English have got their dander up and swear they will fight rather than to lose Oregon, and I guess they will. The people will hear out the English governor in making war on that point. For my own part, although I am aware that the British can lick the world, and we can lick the British, I think it could be folly and madness to be driven into a war for the sake of more territory. We have got quite territory enough for the present, and we are perfectly sure of having Oregon by adopting Mr. Calhoun's advice to let the question rest and let our people settle there. War is always, or nearly always, a curse to a nation, and it would be particularly so to America. I hope in God's name the Democratic Party will not be so rash as to force Mr. Polk into such measures regarding Oregon as will bring about a war with England. All depends upon the Democratic Party. They can, at this moment, force or avert war between the two nations. I hope they will avert it. Thus ended his comments to Philo on that situation. But a few days later, Barnum picked up the topic again in a letter to Mr. West. West being one of the editors of the New York Atlas, Barnum expressed the hope that he would compose an editorial informing people of the volatile mood in England and present a convincing argument that such a war would be folly. There is a great deal of fear on this side of the water that America and England will get into a war about Oregon and the territorial extensions desired by many of our people. What the devil ails them to be so crazy about adding more acres to our already over-large territory? England will surely fight, sooner than to let America take possession of any part of Oregon which England believes does not belong to her, America. And I hope in God that your views will lead you to deprecate and discourage that spirit in America, which appears determined at all hazards to take possession of territory which, if clearly ours, is yet a subject of dispute with other powers. Let arbitration settle the matter, or else let it rest fifty years unsettled, and by that time no war will be necessary to have it all right. We have nothing to gain by war. On the contrary, such an event would saddle us with heavy public debt, cripple our commerce, and throw upon us a host of pensioners for the next fifty years. There is much more probability of war soon than is generally supposed in America, and the thing is to be deprecated. Going back to Barnum's letter to Philo, we find that his political views are also embedded in remarks about his half-brother's prestigious new job. A previous letter indicated that Philo had been given the Bridgeport postmaster position, at least in part due to Barnum's efforts, writing to people who could influence the decision. Barnum wrote, I am glad to hear that you have got the post office. It's rather more than I expected. But since you have got it, you are sure to keep it during Polk's administration, and I hope much longer. If the Democratic Party is true to itself and does not commit some great folly or stupendous wrong, there is no reason why they should not hold the power in America for an age. It has a decided majority, and nothing except its own folly can convert that majority into a minority. As strong a proponent of the party as Barnum was at that time, Less than ten years later, he was thoroughly disillusioned by the Democrats' stance on slavery, especially with the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854, allowing slavery in the new territories if the popular vote supported it. By 1860, Barnum had switched to the anti-slavery Republican Party. On the matter of calling in a favor from Philo, Barnum brought up the subject of a young man who was the son of English friends to whom he had promised assistance by finding him employment in America. 
Barnum said only to Philo that the young man's parents wanted him to see the world, but a letter to Hitchcock revealed that the real reason was their disapproval of a love relationship their son was forming. They felt that separation, with an ocean between the two, would be for the best. Curiously, the young man's name is not mentioned in the introductory information given to Philo, nor is the parent's surname, which we know from other correspondence was Collins. Barnum only advised Philo, A family in London, friends of mine, are sending out their son to America to see the world and to work at his trade, which is saddling. I have given him letters to you and Mr. Miller and Hitchcock. He will arrive in New York about the 20th of December and will immediately call on Hitchcock. I hope you will not fail to get him a chance to work at his trade in Bridgeport. He is said to be a good workman, and he is a young man of intelligence and good habits. He is English, but he speaks and writes French as well as English. His parents are of the first respectability, and at their request I promised to use all influence in my power to get him a place. Clarifying the timing and type of work the young man needed, Barnum added, Will you try at once to secure him a situation and then write to Hitchcock, so that as soon as the young man arrives he may go to work? I would feel particularly obliged in your attending to this. He does not work at harness, but saddles. If he can earn a few dollars per week above his board, he will be satisfied at least for the commencement, till he gets acquainted. I understood from his parents that in London he earned nearly two pounds, ten dollars, per week beside his board, but they were particularly anxious he should spend a few years in America even if he could not earn half so much as in England. Barnum concluded by asking Philo, Do try to do the best you can for the young chap. He is about 18 years old. He does not go over without some money in his pocket, though probably not a great deal. He will doubtless be glad to board with you if you keep boarders and if you get him work. The comment that the young man could speak and write in French as well as English is telling, since we've seen how dearly Barnum desired that skill for his daughter Caroline. Attaining fluency in French was something he regarded very highly and wished he himself had achieved. At the beginning of his letter to Philo, he explained the circumstances of his months in France and the discipline that had been necessary to learn to do business in a foreign language. My labor has been double on account of not better understanding the language. However, I have pretty well mastered that now, for I have done the advertising for the general for four months, keeping always ten or twelve days ahead of the company, and thus being alone, I was forced to learn and to speak the language. For the first few weeks, I went every day with a big French and English dictionary under my arm, so that if I called on the mayor or any other person on business and they made use of a word which I did not fully understand, I begged them to hold up a minute till I found it in the dictionary. By this means, and by having more patience than I generally get credit for, I got along somehow, and now I can understand about all that is said to me and can make myself understood by any Frenchman. So that's not very bad, although I should like it much better if I could speak the language fluently. The undercurrent of Barnum's description suggests he thought Philo was a stranger to exertion, and he needled him about failing to write as well. I have not received a letter from you in a dog's age, which is not very strange since I know your antipathy to writing, especially long letters. His tone brings to mind a rather acid comment made to another correspondent about not having gotten a word of thanks from Philo when he was awarded the postmaster position. Pushing his point further, Barnum offers a comparison to himself, saying, On the contrary, I am scarcely ever so happy as when I have a pen or a book in my hand. But I have had pretty hard work in this country and have found but little time either to read or write. Fortunately for us, Barnum's devotion to pen and ink continued throughout his life. He was a prolific letter writer, as our 750-page copybook amply demonstrates, and an author as well. Communication was so central to his nature that he seems to have had difficulty understanding other people's reluctance to write. We've seen chastising digressions in letters written to his wife, as well as to his sister, half-brother, and friend Moses Kimball. 
The apparent ease with which Barnum expressed his opinions and observations of the world was probably daunting to those who were expected to write back. But for us, who have no such obligation, we can simply enjoy the richness of Barnum's letters and savor the discoveries of his views on everything from raising daughters to what draws visitors to his museum, and now some insights into his political views as well. Kings and Queens Talk of Many Things This episode, exploring a three-page letter from P.T. Barnum to Boston showman Moses Kimball, will highlight interesting new tidbits and provide updates to a couple of previous storylines, rather than focusing on one theme or topic. Hence our title, Talk of Many Things. The letter to Moses Kimball is dated November 29, 1845 and was written from Paris. Barnum's letters to his friend and competitor in Boston typically have the flavor of a sit-down, spill-it-all conversation with a longtime friend. The two hadn't actually known each other more than a few years by the mid-1840s, but they must have quickly discovered their temperaments and interests were compatible, and being less than a year apart in age, a kind of kinship was formed between the two showmen. They developed a degree of mutual trust that would have been uncommon among competitors in that business. The topics in Barnum's letters are wide-ranging, covering a little of this and a little of that, with a bit of reminiscing and gossip, and some of his opinions are freely shared with language that we don't find in his letters to other people. This isn't to say that Barnum was entirely candid in his communications with Kimball. Barnum's tone imparts one-upmanship at times, especially in regard to his European tour, and Barnum was adept at needling people when he chose to. Apparently, Kimball was reluctant to cross the Atlantic or just not interested in visiting foreign countries. Barnum liked to rub that in, taunting him with much rosier descriptions of the general Tom Thumb tour in France than he ever conveyed in his letters to others. He seemed to want Kimball to feel a tad jealous of his success, you may recall how often Barnum complained to others about provincial mayors and theater directors, feeling he had been had more than once by their deceptive conduct or outright dishonesty, and he had revealed to a select few correspondents that the French tour had not been a financial success. But he wasn't about to share that with Kimball. Barnum began his letter by thanking Kimball for his of November 1st, which must have expressed great dissatisfaction working with a man named Rogers. Since Barnum's reply indicates he also knew this man, our guess is this might have been Charles J. Rogers, though we can't be absolutely certain. Charles Rogers was an English circus rider who would soon become a partner with circus owner Gilbert R. Spaulding in 1848. Their circus became famous for its innovations. Rogers had been in the U.S. at least since 1847 when he joined Spalding's Circus as a performer. But if he is the same Rogers, then we know he was here in 1845 when Kimball encountered him. Charles Rogers was seven years Barnum's junior, so the impudent puppy remark might strengthen the case that he was indeed the Rogers in question. This is how Barnum expressed his opinion of the man in his reply to Kimball. I am very glad that you so soon discovered the windiness and emptiness of that vain, conceited jackass, Rogers. I never knew such a self-conceited, arrogant, impudent puppy in my life. He's all gab and nothing else. But I guess he's carried his beans to the wrong market if he expects to pick up greenins about Boston to furnish cash against his sense. In our previous story, we got a taste of Barnum's political opinions, which have been rare so far in these copybook letters. This late November letter to Kimball reaffirms the sentiments expressed to others that engaging in a war with England over the Oregon country would be a big mistake for the U.S., and he also acknowledged that Kimball himself had recently gotten involved in politics. Regarding the possibility of war, Barnum pleaded, don't for heaven's sake let your politicians get into a war with England. That would be the damnedest foolish thing ever known. For whenever we really want any territory in our vicinity, it will always be an easy matter to take it. At present, it would be more of a drag than anything else, and a war would be ruinous to us, and no less so because it would likewise be ruinous to England. John Bull thinks seriously of fighting, but he'd better not, and so had Jonathan. 
John Bull was a character that had been used to personify the British people since the early 1700s. The Jonathan Barnum referred to was Brother Jonathan, the American character who mainly personified New Englanders, or Yankees, for their slyness and cunning, though to the English, Jonathan represented the American people in general. Brother Jonathan was characterized as shrewd and cunning, clever though not highly educated, and with a scrappy and crude personality that contrasted with the more dignified John Bull. In his letter, Barnum spoke of Jonathan as if representing the American people, not just Yankees. Of note, Barnum himself was quite proud of being a Yankee, and despite Jonathan's unattractive traits, he was a beloved character in many ways, as Barnum's voice suggests. As far as Kimball's foray into politics, Barnum advised, So, you are head and ears in politics, eh? Well, go at it while you are young. I went it in my younger days, and spouted and printed myself into jail, soon after which I cooled down, turned stoic, and concluded to let the country take care of itself and be damned. Though, upon my soul, I feared it would go to the devil after I gave up attending to its affairs. And so every politician thinks. Barnum was thinking back to his years between 1831 and 1834, when he was a newspaper man living in Bethel, Connecticut. His weekly publication, Herald of Freedom, later Herald of Freedom and Gospel Witness, triggered three lawsuits for libel, one of which landed him in the Danbury jail for 60 days during autumn of 1832. His admission that the experience caused him to cool down is interesting, as he does not relate that change of heart in his autobiography, and he did continue to publish his newspaper for another two years. Even more fascinating are his next remarks to Kimball about preaching, a short-lived calling that is briefly mentioned in his autobiography. To Kimball, he recalled, Well, after that I used to preach sometimes, and was mightily proud of the powerful arguments which I gave them, and of the large congregations that attended my meetings. But after a while I began to think with the other preacher, Solomon, that it was all vanity and vexation of spirit. So I gave up such profitless and vain callings, and went into the Joyce Hath, Mermaid, and Tom Thumb business, and found it much more profitable, not to say honorable. But it's all in a lifetime, and it's well once in a while to take a turn at spouting. It gives diffident gentlemen like you and me confidence, especially when we get cheered at the end of our speeches. So go ahead, my boy, and the Lord give you luck. According to Barnum's first autobiography, The Life of P.T. Barnum, during a period of various partnerships with traveling showmen in 1837, he left partner Z. Graves in Kentucky while he set off for Northwest Ohio to re-engage a performer named Pentland. While in Tiffin, a town southeast of Toledo, Barnum recalled, I was a stranger in the town, but religious conversation at the hotel introduced me to several gentlemen who solicited me to lecture on certain subjects which we had discussed. I complied, and the town schoolhouse was crowded by an attentive congregation in the afternoon and evening of the Sabbath. A gentleman from the Republic newspaper urged me to deliver two lectures in that town on the evenings of September 4th and 5th, which I did. A year before this, Barnum had spoken from a pulpit after a minister had declared circus people lacking in morality. He felt compelled to vindicate the character of the people in his traveling circus. Barnum also wrote that during this period of his life, he had gathered together his company of circus folk on many a Sabbath in order to read sermons to them. Pertaining to showmen's exhibitions, Barnum followed up on a previous letter that had mentioned the infant girls with partially twinned bodies, whom he had seen in Paris and sorely wanted to sign for a multi-year contract at the American Museum. Though he had written to Kimball then with great enthusiasm, he was not overly optimistic that the parents could be persuaded. We subsequently learned from a letter dated November 12th that the parents had refused the offer, though Barnum, posing as an agent, was trying once again to spark their interest. In this letter to Kimball, we find that Barnum still had not given up hope, for he wrote, I begin to think I can get the living child with two heads into my museum, if I can, it will more than raise hell. 
That exhibition, to be sure, will not be quite as scientific as the petrified body. Still, it will do. You may recall it was Fortis Hitchcock's idea to exhibit a recently discovered petrified body, and that despite Barnum's doubts about the public's interest in seeing it, his museum manager had been spot on, and the body had been an incredible draw for visitors. Barnum acknowledged in a letter to Hitchcock that same day, November 29th, I would as soon have thought of exhibiting a carrion, and thus I see I should have been mightily mistaken, and you was right. No less proud of his own talents in promoting and exhibiting, Barnum penned a flurry of letters about General Tom Thumb's success upon returning from Paris from the provincial tour. Seven of the nine letters Barnum wrote on November 29th contain exuberant descriptions of entertaining French royalty. The two that do not mention this are brief notes. To Kimball, Barnum boasted, I was last night before the king and family for the third time, and if you could, as I did, have seen and heard the queen spat her hands and cry bravo, general, bravo, as the general sang and danced, etc., you would have cried, vive la humbug. His lively recounting of the evening to his other correspondents gives us a vision of that memorable performance. To his London friend Brittel, Barnum wrote, General Tom Thumb visited King Louis Philippe for the third time last night at St. Cloud. The general was enthusiastically received by the royal family and a large circle of distinguished personages, including some foreigners of distinction. Monsieur Guizot was also there. The king and royal family congratulated the general on his improved appearance, his improvements in the French language, he sang them several French songs, and declared that in their opinion he had decreased in size since his last visit to the Tuileries in May. Before leaving, they literally loaded him with valuable presents, each person being desirous of presenting him with a keepsake, as he departs for England in a few days, and soon afterwards for America. He received presents from the King, Queen, Princess Adelaide, Comte de Paris, Duchesse d'Orléans, Duchesse de Nemours, etc. These consist of diamond pins and rings, gold chains, elegant boxes, caskets and souvenirs inlaid with pearls and precious stones, etc. These treasures were added to those General Tom Thumb had already received on previous visits to the royal family, which included a large emerald brooch set with diamonds. The king and queen were clearly quite taken with Stratton's manner and performances, and their daughter had already seen him at Buckingham Palace. According to Barnum, it was at the time of the general's last audience before the king of the French at saint Cloud that he was asked to perform his impersonation of Napoleon Bonaparte in costume. This was done on the QT, since Louis-Philippe was staunchly anti-Bonapartist, and Barnum has wisely sidelined that character role during the Tour of France. However, the king had heard of it, perhaps from his daughter, and was curious, so he requested that Tom Thumb do his portrayal of Napoleon, the only time that happened in France. Moses Kimball, being someone who knew Barnum's low opinion of Tom Thumb's parents, Sherwood and Cynthia Stratton, Barnum followed the success of the royal visit with a related story about yet another of the parents' annoying and dull-witted behaviors abroad. In this case, the incident concerned their son's visit to the king and queen. Stratton was often the butt of Barnum's jokes, as Barnum had little liking or tolerance for a person who, lacking a formal education, still took no interest in bettering himself when the opportunities were before him. Poking fun at Stratton's manner of speech, Barnum gloated to Kimball. Stratton was determined to go with his wife and see the king at the time the general went. For Stratton said, He just wanted to see what in hell kings and queens was made on, and he liked to have the old woman say when she got home that she had been before the king and queen. I, of course, would not object to such a beautiful arrangement, but merely mentioned that it would be quite unnecessary for me to go, as the king only wished to see the general and his parents so they could do the exhibiting. Strange to say, they took the gentle hint and gave up going a king seeing. One last tidbit. With a verbal wink and nod, Barnum informed Kimball that General Tom Thumb's birthday was about a month away, and he would be turning 14. By the way, the general is 14 years old in January next. He's getting along, you see. Though it was true that Charles's birthday was coming up on January 4th, 
Barnum was actually keeping Kimball in the know about the boy's currently correct age. That is to say, he was continuing to promote the boy to the public as a full six years older than he actually was. Barnum knew Kimball would applaud his clever deception, vive la humbug, to boost the wow factor of Charles's stature based on age. But frankly, it seems more impressive that a seven-year-old was so talented and tireless. Stay tuned. Thanks for listening to this episode of Becoming Barnum, The Journey to Fame and Fortune. This podcast was produced by the Barnum Museum. All episodes are based on the blog series Barnum's Letters from Abroad by Adrian St. Pierre, curator of the Barnum Museum. Editing and sound design are by Rui Pino and narration by William Saris. Kathleen Marr is our executive director and John Swing is our chief operations officer. Please visit our website at www.barnum-museum.org to learn more about the museum. Don't forget to connect with us on social media and visit the Barnum Museum's YouTube channel for behind-the-scenes presentations of our fascinating collections and more stories about the legendary showman. Please tune in next time as we continue our adventures in Europe with P.T. Barnum.